and then let me we have 12 13 that's awesome wow. <laughs> let me share the screen real quick <laughs> double check we have 13 Perfect. and <laughs> so she figured out how to do it you know we, we have it known and leave it to sally okay and i'm sure we have there we go treat, so welcome welcome to our group well thank, thank you, you for coming sally. thank you so much right, back, right there i i feel like i'm the ethel merman of the 21st century because i project but I'll use the microphone. And uh, I just let me make sure I've done everything I need to do. I, I believe I have. I just want to say I'm so pleased to be here. I um, am a member of Wild Ones and appreciate all that you do. And how's that? Is that better? Okay. And I'm happy to share the stories about the gardens up on Signal Mountain on Walden's Ridge. You know, it's hard to talk about these stories and not talk about personal things yourself. So I thought I'd give you, I don't know everyone here and I don't know who all knows me. So I thought I'd just give you a little background. Richard, who is right out here, my husband and I moved up to Signal Mountain not quite 10 years ago. We moved from Memphis. Um, I had just retired from FedEx. Richard had retired earlier. I was uh, corporate tax, Did uh, I was over the global income tax function, the vice president. And uh, it's funny, I never thought that I would have that kind of a career. I, I grew up thinking I was gonna be a stay-at-home mom. I was of that generation. and. Uh, lo and behold, I ended up uh, going back to work a second, uh, back to school a second time, got my CPA and the master's in tax and entered the corporate world. And I have a family, two children, uh, a daughter and a son, Ashley and David, and they're uh, grown now. But all the time that I was working, taking care of family. I had just a little time for gardening. I loved it. I grew up with my dad who uh, was a gardener. He uh, was, he was born and raised in Deckard, Tennessee. And he used to work in the uh, nurseries there, even when he was just six years old. So I grew up with the love of gardening. I just didn't have a lot of time until I moved to Signal Mountain. And we moved to the backside in Sequatchie County. And I went from being the Memphis Belle to being that Sequatchie lady. <laughs> and uh, so when I retired and we moved here, Richard and I had wanted to take the Master Gardener program. We had heard about it back in Memphis. So we did that together and loved it. And then coincidentally, first Memorial Day in uh, 2015, McCoy Farm and Gardens had their first annual Memorial Day picnic. And it was the beginning of their being open as a community park. And when I did that, I decided I love this place. There was a lot of a lot going on. They had cleaned out the old legacy beds, they call them the horseshoe beds. And I volunteered, I got to volunteering at that point and got involved in um, the pollinator gardens, which we'll talk about in just a minute. I, I'm going to be the first to admit I am not an expert. I have learned so much from other gardeners, studying, doing, creative people but I'm, I'm not a super expert, but I love gardening. And so I'll share what I have and, and I've tried to uh, present as much information as I thought we could tolerate. <laughs> this story of these gardens, there are three separate, two separate gardens and a garden initiative up on Walden's Ridge. And they're really a story of transformation. It's a transformation of people, place, 
It's about process and it's a, a transformation of the community itself. So why don't we get started? We'll start first with, is that working? This will be about McCoy Farm and Gardens, the pollinator gardens, and these are the old legacy gardens. I thought I'd just talk briefly about the history. The earliest recorded history is in 1863 during the Civil War when uh, the Union Army took that property as a stopover place on their way down to Chattanooga after the uh, Battle of Chickamauga. And, you know, one of the claims to fame is, is Ulysses S. S. Grant rode past McCoy on Anderson Pike down the W, and he supposedly said it was one of the most difficult roads he's ever been down. And I get it. <laughs> <laughs> most of the history, the more current history, is about the Bachman and McCoy family. Uh, there were six sons and four daughters of the Jonathan and Francis Bachman couple. And one, they were involved in the Civil War. Several of the sons were involved in the Confederate Army, but not all of them. It's kind of like today. There, there can be difference of opinions, even in families today. And one of the sons was a Union sympathizer, which I always thought was interesting. I assumed everybody South the Mason-Dixon line was Confederate, but that's really not the case. And uh, they, ha Jonathan had been a chaplain in the army. And when, when the war was over, he became a pastor at the um, First Presbyterian Church in Chattanooga. And that was during the time uh, of the yellow fever epidemic. And he was instrumental in providing service and care for anybody that had the illness. It didn't matter what standing in society, race, anything. He was uh, very, very generous in that. His son, Nathan Bachman, became, uh, he went to law school, UVA, and he um, practiced law. He went on to the Tennessee Supreme Court, and then he became a U.S. Senator. So that's part of McCoy's claim to fame is we, it's the home place of one of the U.S. senators. And his daughter, Martha Bachman McCoy, was the, the person who gave the property to the town of Walden. Part of it was a gift and part of it was a purchase. And then they lived there and took care of their elderly mother and had Sally McCoy Garland. She now lives in, um, in North Carolina and I think she's in her early 90s. So she's getting on up there and has uh, several sons and they maintain an interest in the property. I included this to show some of the pictures of the McCoy property probably after World War II. You can see uh, right here, there's a vegetable garden in front of the historic barn, which has just recently been uh, refurbished. That's, that's a whole nother story, and I'll mention that towards the end. And this is uh, Martha McCoy's flower garden, and that's gonna be the spot where the children's garden is now. Now, in this picture, there's a gardener hiding in there. It's kind of like finding Elmo, but this is finding uh, Nevin, Nevin Hatfield. So we did have the Hatfields and the McCoys, but it was a collaborative partnership, not, not hostile. Can you see him? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle him right here. And it's interesting. He was beloved and, and was very loyal to the family. And it was in her, uh, Martha's will that he would remain in the house, the caretaker's house, that is the site of the dog park now until his death. And, and that was the way it happened. And then there's Emma Bell Miles. This is the last little bit of history. I'm, I'm sure y'all are aware of her. 
She's a, a naturalist, a poet, an artist, a writer. I have several of her books and drawings, uh, copies of the drawings. And she lived on the corner of the property that's right at uh, Anderson Pike and Taft Highway, if you've ever been up there. And part of the trails go around to what remains the, of that property. It's really just the foundation stones. So, place of history and a place for community. This is a schematic. We've got the main house right here and the old barn, and there's a party pavilion that uh, people use for meetings and what have you. I think uh, that Wild Ones had their annual meeting in that uh, place. We have worked on the heat since then. <laughs> and there's an apple house and all the apple orchards and parking. And there's also this trail. It's, it's a perimeter trail of about uh, 1.2 miles, but there have been additional trails added so that it's almost a two mile hike around the property if you take all the little side trails. Let's see. Okay, this is what it looked like before, before I ever got there, the year before we moved and got involved, uh, there was a group of volunteers that cleaned all of this out. You can see it's uh, pretty sad, of course it's winter, but even in, it was wilder looking in, in spring and summer. And this was what they had to work with when they started revitalizing these gardens. There's a story about that, uh, that the trunk of that tree. I had gone to a board meeting and it had been cut off about halfway down and it was dark like it is now. I think it was even a, a cold evening. Board meeting was finished and uh, Andy Jones, who was instrumental in doing the trails and clearing out a lot of the uh, kudzu and what have you. He said, do you know how to, um, I drive a standard shift, and I said, well, of course I do. I learned uh, with my sister's VW. And he said, well, I'm going to get the Bobcat, and you're going to drive the tractor, and we're going to pull up that, that stuff. And so, and so we did. We, we had the headlights on, and we pulled that up. Now, that was more than what I thought I'd gotten into. But. So this is what it's beginning to look like after it's all been cleared out. And it, it becomes, you know, you can begin to see some space that you could do something with. And we had uh, outlined the perimeter with um, bricks and then filled in with stones. But I wanted to show this picture because what I always love are the people that make this happen. And these are still, some of these people are still on the board. Let me go to the next one. Jody Hunter and Jeremy Logan were key to getting these gardens started. They, I don't think they'd be what they are today without them. And I, she was the one that convinced me to work at McCoy and I just have always appreciated both of them. And here's Charlene Nash. She basically designed the gardens. I would say the gardens are not 100% natives. These particular gardens are probably maybe 70% natives. There are other gardens or flower beds that are tended by a different person. Those are not necessarily natives. So I'm just letting you know about that. But the ones that we've worked in are primarily native plants. And there's Linda Andrews. She was a uh, key in that early group. I love that picture with her kind of poking around. Hilda Horton and Terry Miles. These look like planting days. I love this picture because it looks like an American Gothic to me. You know, you got, got this. Okay, and it, I'll just go through these. I think that's Kit and Linda and is it Mary O'Neill? It's been a while since I've seen her. And then there's another group where we were so uh, pleased to be there. It's beginning to be spring. 
Kit, there you are. <laughs> Marty Roberts with the cut leaf cone flower, which is a blessing and a curse because it, it, it is very enthusiastic and we have, we have had to, we've had to work hard to kind of keep it reined in. Now, place for pollinators. Y'all all know this, but I got to reading up on it again. I thought, because part of the purpose of those McCoy pollinator gardens were, was to attract monarchs. And let me get my notes so I don't forget anything. There are two things I'm just going to talk briefly about. One is the life cycle of the monarch. And the other, which is really more interesting, is the lifespan of the monarch. And it depends on which direction they're going as to what their lifespan is. So if you have your female, male and female, they're flittering around and flirting and they mate. And the female can lay between 3, 300 and 1,000 eggs, which I thought was just extraordinary. I can't imagine. And the eggs are attached to the underside of the leaf, milkweed, because that's what is required for the uh, larva, the caterpillar. In three to five days, they hatch to the caterpillar. It's not even a quarter of an inch when it hatches, just this tiny little thing. And it eats only milkweed. There's a chemical that effectively defends them from predators, makes it untasty. And it, it transfers into the adult, even though adults don't eat the milkweed, they go for nectar. Um, they molt five times during their life cycle. And at the end of that, they're about one to two inches long and they attach themselves to the underneath side of the milkweed and develop into the chrysalis. And it undergoes a metamorphosis. It takes 10 to 14 days and you can begin to see the, the butterfly as it gets more translucent, transparent, and then the adult butterfly comes out. Now, what I was going to mention about the lifespan, and again, y'all may know this already, but I just was reading up on it. This is amazing. Um, how long a monarch lives depends on which direction they're going. In March, they, they uh, get active and they leave Mexico and fly north. And over a number of generations over the summer, you have more and more monarchs. The, they last about two to five weeks. So there are multiple versions of um, monarchs, individuals during that period. Now in August and thereabouts, when they go back south, those individual monarchs live eight to nine months. It's just amazing. So they fly potentially 3,000 miles if they start up in Canada and go to their nesting place, their resting place for the winter. And they're the ones that come active again after eight or nine months. Just quite amazing. a place for beauty. Now we're gonna get into the gardens. These are, I've included these because they're actual pictures that were taken at McCoy and we were so pleased to have them. I took that one so I know what happened. <laughs> and then there's one. That's on the, uh, the flower bed that's not native, <laughs> but they don't care. So these are some of the plants that are in the gardens there. Common milkweed, we, that's one of our priorities. And I have on these slides the uh, common name and then the botanical name. Swamp milkweed, smooth Solomon seal, 
And we have areas that are sunny and areas that are uh, shady or partly sunny. We have a variety of ferns. We have Christmas ferns and I'll, I'll never forget. Remember, I'm not an expert, but I, I'm a learner. And somebody showed me that the way you can tell is the leaf has a little uh, projection that looks like a, a, a thumb, like a hand mitt, a Christmas mitt. So I'd always remember those. And one of my favorites are the maidenhair fern and then ostrich fern. Foam flower, they're so beautiful uh, in the spring, spring ephemeral. Yarrow, we have several colors of yarrow too, yellow and white and red. Beard's tongue, penstemon. Columbine. I did, uh, one of the things that I did when I was a board member, I don't know, I've just got a hair to do these things. I did little videos about the gardens and one of them, there were a number of um, flowers that were mentioned in Hamlet's play, Shakespeare's Hamlet. And Ophelia is talking about the different flowers and I always remember Columbine being on her list. Blue false indigo, hardy geranium, fennel, and we planted that because it's the host for the swallowtail caterpillar. Star of Persia, this is not a native, but it is beautiful. It's an alum, allium. Mouse ear, Coreopsis. And those are, if you look at the leaves, y'all know this, but if you look at the leaves, they're two little tiny uh, projections on either side of the main leaf and it looks like mouse ears. So that's easy for me to remember. Red valerium. We have hydrangeas, oak leaf, panicle. I call this one little bobo. I don't know why that always makes me laugh. <laughs> and then we have uh, zaleas. Winterberry holly. This is not a native, but it is a beautiful blooming dogwood. It's, I think, a Japanese um, immigrant. So this is what uh, they look like generally. So that's, that's the end of the pollinator garden section. And we'll go on to Walden natives. Uh, this was a project when Lee Davis was voted in as mayor and I had helped him uh, in the election process. I wrote postcards on his behalf and you know did the little things. He was uh, one of the ones who had been careful to follow the rules on, you may remember the food city issue. And as it turned out, the court agreed with Lee Davis, but he was voted in as mayor. And he's, uh, he called me up, maybe that was a Tuesday, he called me up maybe Friday. And he said, uh, would you help out with the community native plant initiative? And I'm going, well, and I said, well, sure. <laughs> it's probably what y'all would have said, right? And he said, just however you want to do it. And so uh, I thought, well, what on earth would I do? Now, I've been at that point, I had been here probably seven or eight years. So I had begun to know people. Gardening is a great way to make new friends and uh, learn about gardening, but make new friends as well. So I had a number of email contacts that I knew were gardeners. And I just sent out this uh, broadcast email that described what we were trying to do and asked for feedback, any interest. And uh, I got maybe 20 to 30 people that were interested. And so I thought, well, when are we going to get started? Because, if, you know, elections are in November. And I thought, well, we could do a lot before spring to prepare the ground. So 
I'll go into that in a minute. And then I said, I thought, well, where are we going to do this? And I got feedback from this group. It was very interactive. And uh, public spaces, because it's a Walden initiative. It's not private. It's public. It's part of the community. So there were three welcome signs. One is up at the top of the W. There's the town hall, Bachman Community Center, and Sandy Lusk wanted to be sure that uh, Lone Oak Community Center was included too. Even though it wasn't in Walden, it wasn't even in Hamilton County. It was out in Sequatchie County, where I live. So we uh, we worked on that. And so how do you really get it going? With the Zoom meetings, the people grew. There was a lot of interest, a lot of talent, experience. We discussed the sites and people volunteered for particular sites. So we broke into teams and I acted as a kind of an organizer, uh, resource provider, um, to some extent an advisor, although the people I worked with really knew so much more than I did, thank goodness. <laughs> I'm always happy for that. And then what about funding? Well, the town of Walden had a little bit and Wild Warrens donated to this effort, and we appreciate it so much. It was uh, from the Doug Newton Memorial Fund, and we put all of those dollars into native plants. So what kind of support did we provide? Food prevention. We put down cardboard or cardboard-like cloth, not cloth, but paper, that were on rolls. And before we did that, we improved the soil with mushroom compost and, and uh, things like that. Put down the uh, weed barrier, covered it in mulch, and then we began designing the gardens. And it was on me to figure out where to find those plants. So these are the before pictures of the three Walden sound, uh, town signs. And you can see we had quite a bit that we could work with because there wasn't a whole lot there. There was a little bit, I think the uh, Guild of uh, Walden Bridge had done some work on the signs. So we inherited some of that, which was nice. This was one of the signs, this is Marga Davis. And we had developed kind of, uh, for the signs, we thought the first year we would try to do something similar across all three signs, even though they were different sizes, different uh, uh, sunlight and what have you. So we developed that kind of a plan. And then I didn't have an after picture on that last one, so I apologize. This one is the Walden sign at Taft and Anderson. Again, you can see we had, not much, not much was there. So this is what it looked like this past August. And then this was the main sign. And we had all great teams of people. Um, and you can see uh, the picture on the right is what it looked like that first spring after we planted native azaleas and uh, native plants in the, in the main area. And these are uh, evolving. We're still working on them. We'll probably do something slightly different as we learn each, each season. Walden Town Hall, not much there. And before I go to the next picture, <laughs> I have to tell you it's aspirational because I never did get a picture of it afterwards. So this is what we would hope it would look like. One is Polston Lacey in England, and the other is Monet's Garden in France. And Richard and I had gone on a trip this past June, and these were some of the gardens we had seen. So aspirational, just kidding. <laughs> Bachman Community Center, Barbara Womack, Allison Hoffman. Who else, is anyone else here work on Bachman? Uh, yeah, Jackie Lyons. Yeah, and Joni Evans. And uh, 
question. Again, there wasn't much there, and we did soil improvement, weed control, mulching, and planting. And that's what it looked like uh, part of this summer. I probably missed some of the blooms. Beg your pardon? Oh, did they? Those, they are so rascally. And then Lone Oak Community Center, Diane Ryder, I don't know if y'all know her, she's uh, very active in the natives and uh, gardens. I think she's very active in the National Garden clubs. Uh, Bill Lusk and Diane were the main builders of this and I was kind of their helper. Whatever they need me to do, I'd do it. And Diane went to uh, Signal Mountain Nursery and got topsoil and mushroom compost and we shoveled it in. And then we planted uh, various things, a lot of milkweed and uh, rubecchia. And you never know what could happen. The next year we had all these little volunteers from the, um, from the uh, milkweed. And so I fulfilled uh, one of my bucket lists, an item on my bucket list that I didn't know I had. <laughs> I had a booth at the 127 yard sale. I never thought I would have a booth there. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says almost free because it was almost free. We, I think we charged a dollar just to keep them honest, <laughs> a dollar for each plant. And but we made $135 for Lono, just from volunteers. So uh, there, those are the main uh, gardens that we've done in the Walton Bridge uh, Native Initiative. But uh, there's one more that we're working on kind of as we as I speak. And that's at the Mountain Opry, the Walden's Ridge Guild. And we're putting in oak leaf hydrangeas and native azaleas uh, probably in the next week to two weeks, depending on the temperature. And then next spring, we'll do perennials. Uh, there is on, well, tell me which one you're thinking of. Yes. Yes, and that one was already being handled because, and it's beautiful. Right. <laughs> that chair. Yeah. Well, I remember big rocks. And then they, um, in the 80s, Mary Jane Pinky met with, who was it that lived across from Sandy Jackson that had a great you know, farm? That Indian Pinky Pinky, like that. Oh, yeah. He, he helped her, and they got railroad ties up from downtown. She put it in, and there were a bunch of iron. Yeah. And there still are, but they haven't gone enough to refresh mm -hmm. And so Mary Jane tended it all these years. And I think, didn't Mary Beth? Yeah, the neighbors in our neighborhood yeah. all got together to do it. So right. It's really beautiful, nice. too. I should have gotten a picture of that one, but it's not part of, technically part of this, but it really it's is. Nice from, uh, okay. From the, yeah, the no, town? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And we also asked to go to Yeah. <laughs> you can't be. <laughs> okay. Good idea. Okay, and then the last garden, I call this our COVID garden because, and really the Walden natives happened during COVID. You didn't do a lot outside. <laughs> what do you do when COVID hits? You plan and design gardens. The, again, these are before pictures. Remember the old historic pictures of the uh, Mrs. McCoy's cutting garden? Well, this is what remained, and uh, we had used it as a heal-in garden for various plants, but we got permission from the board to create a children's sensory garden, and 
There you see it's beginning. We had taken all of the uh, plants out and moved them and replanted them around the parking area. And it's beautiful in the spring. We went through a design process. We used Zoom all during the pandemic because it was over the winter of 2020, 21. It was over that winter and we didn't want to be in each other's homes, each other's space. Everybody was concerned about not getting COVID. Uh, so we could do it on Zoom. This was our beginning. Here's the, let me do this. This is the little area where the garden is now. And here's the barn and that little pump house. And there's a big linden tree. And the kids love that because it has this ginormous uh, branch that goes out. And they climb up on it and pretend it's their uh, steed, their horse. And then there, there are other areas in, in, the, in the vicinity. This is a historic boxwood area. And a lot of brides walk through here and then get married right there. So we were thinking maybe we would put up a trellis and just different things. That was the initial idea. Then we went uh, to geometrics and benches and uh, various people on the team, and I'll show you their picture at the end, uh, came up with designs. We had uh, three different butterfly designs. Thought that would be uh, interesting. This is the layout for the beds. And then we uh, got interested in mazes because we could imagine the children running in and in the spring and summer when everything is tall and in bloom, they could hide behind some of the uh, beds and play hide and seek and chase. We had more. And we began looking at things that children could do, a little playhouse, benches, did we need fencing, trellis? But this was the winner. And one of the women on the team, Elizabeth Hamilton, I don't know if y'all know her, she lives up on Signal and she was the director at Microsoft over the Xbox. And she, she's an engineer, she's from this area and came back. And she had, she's very knowledgeable about native plants and she had skills that were amazing. So she uh, drafted this for us. And then here is a draft and I have uh, sheets of it that y'all can look at at the end. And all the plants that we had decided on, she put in there. So if with our Zoom meetings and trying to figure out what would be appropriate, we developed distinct sections of the garden. We had a cutting garden, which was a historical tip of the hat to Martha McCoy. There's some natives, not all, but we wanted to preserve that front area of the bed so that uh, we would honor her sense of gardening. There was a fairy garden and a painted village. And Celia Mattingly, who works at Signal Mountain Nursery, I think she's a horticulturist as well. She's, she's just an amazing person. She developed all of the uh, fairy gardens and the design for the plants. And then there was another lady, Elaine Montero, who is an artist and she painted the rocks so they would look like a village. And then she painted, you'll see them in the video at the end. Uh, she painted a little bumblebee and a ladybug, things that children would like. And then uh, Kit and Marty designed the native plant bed. And you can see all kinds of, that, that isn't the full list, but just representative. And then we had a shrub bed to kind of uh, put up a barrier between the children's garden and that area where uh, brides and grooms were getting married. And so as a backdrop, we put in these uh, little uh, little quick fire hydrangeas and lavender and some other things. And Elizabeth Hamilton wanted more than anything to have an herb spiral. 
So we we did that, and those those uh, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. I couldn't help myself, <laughs> you know. Simon and Garfunkel, you know, I was of that generation. <laughs> there are things other than that. And then we, um, Kit had uh, an animal name plant bed, mouse ear, coreopsis, pig squeak was my favorite name. The plant has not lived up quite to what I thought it was going to be, but a goat's beard, lamb's ear, pussy toes. And then we have an edible bed that has uh, blueberries, three blueberry plants. And we have put in tomatoes and sweet peppers, things like that. It, that bed, uh, we're working on how to, better to design that. And then we had a trellis that you'll see in the pictures where the kids could enter in and then a tunnel. And we had a uh, passion flower that was blooming this summer that had grown over that trellis and the kids crawl through it and just great fun. So here's some uh, pictures of the beginning and people working. There's Larry Roberts and Bill Lusk and that's probably Celia and Marty and Elaine, I think. And uh, we, we developed the perimeter, it's a 40 by 50. We augmented the soil with compost, and then we covered it with that uh, weed covering. Larry Roberts had gotten that for us. And you see, we have a supervisor right here inspecting, and he, he gave us the thumbs up. And once we got that all finished and watered it down so it would lay down, we felt victorious. And this is, but you can see we're, it's still in the middle of COVID, mass mandates and what have you. And then we put uh, a kind of a mulch, it's um, wood chips that were just donated to McCoy. So we, we were uh, not extravagant in what we, we put more into the plants than we did the mulch. And there's Richard, uh, my Richard. We went down to Dunlap and got eight tons, eight tons of stone. And here you can see the bobcat delivering them. I had them put at the four corners so that uh, we could uh, move those around according to our design. And you can see we're beginning. There's uh, the, two of the pallets are gone and maybe this is the last one. And you can see we had the cutting garden, the little hidey hole and the fairy garden. We also did irrigation because one of the, th it's sunny, it's you know, like this summer we had a drought and it's a children's space. We didn't wanna have sprinklers going and getting everything wet. So uh, Elizabeth and I designed the, and installed the irrigation system. It's in ground. We did have help. Kit, the, what's the name of the gentleman that was at ACE that's gone on to a management position? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's probably better than I am, though. <laughs> but anyway, he helped... Uh, Johannes, exactly. He was awesome. And he helped dig the trenches um, so that we could lay the main um, lines from the well house. We use well water. And I had two timers, one for one timer for to turn on the well pump and another timer that I had to coordinate to use uh, to for the water delivery system. So we had a surprise the next spring. All the dandelions came back up <laughs> and they were in our walkways, <laughs> but they were beautiful. And we dug them up and, and uh, relocated them and they're all doing well, or most of them, I guess. This is a picture of uh, my garage after I got the plants from Overhill Nurseries, which was one of our big sources. And that was planting day. And we had special mulch to put in the beds. And there's uh, the herb spiral. And this first year we had uh, a circle for a playhouse. We 
uh, decided to go with um, sunflowers and just let them grow up and around and the kids could come inside and they did come inside. They had a great time. And this is uh, the early summer of 2021. You can see in the picture on the right that uh, the sunflowers really did have a nice showing that year. And we had a garden club from, I want to say it was Winchester, but I should have looked it up, so I apologize. But they were there looking, and uh, I think Kit and Marty and I and maybe others were uh, touring them around the gardens. And then this is a picture, I love this picture. This is Mariah Prescott's son at the fairy garden. And he's, you know, and then here we have a uh, hopscotch, one through 10. And each uh, number has, like the first one, I, I think is one caterpillar. And then there are two bees, or, and you get the idea. And um, Elaine Montero did those. And then in the spring, Sherry Kent and her husband, and Sherry's here, I know, because I saw her, yeah, right back there. And Richard and I put together this uh, willow, woven willow dome. And I'll show you in a minute. Uh, I think we've got it on the little video that we're gonna show in just a minute. But Sherry is so vested in this. Every time I see her, she's tucking in the, the little uh, leaves and, and She's just done a great job. And it wasn't easy. It took us, what, four or five hours to put that together. And there were like eight pages of instructions. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the team. So you have Marty and Celia, Elaine, myself, Kit, Elizabeth, and Sherry, you were missing that day. And we have others that come on work days at McCoy and just do so much. We do weeding, we add plants, we deadhead, we trim. And then the last thing, and for the folks on uh, the Zoom, I apologize if the video is a little bit shaky. We we tried very hard to make sure our setup would not do that, but I think it may still be. But this is just a short video of what the garden looked like in the summer of 21. And then in a few places, I've interjected what it looked like in August of 22. And you can see just how much, how much it grew the first year. We couldn't get over it. And then by the second year, you know how plants are. They, they get their feet in and they're ready to roam. So let's see here.
thank y'all. And I want to thank you for allowing me to come and share these stories about people, the place, the process. I, I'm always intrigued by process, the plants themselves and family. In the process, my daughter and two grandchildren both came and worked in the gardens, volunteered on more than one occasion. And my son developed a video of the restoration of the barn at McCoy, which is a really interesting uh, story. The video and other videos uh, from McCoy are on their YouTube site. Just go to YouTube, McCoy Farm and Gardens, and uh, that the barn video is well it's artistic and it's it's beautiful and it's a great story. Hmm. And gardens. And uh, so, like I said at the beginning, it's kind of a story of transformation. It was for me personally. I went from a, a tax geek. I always say everybody was jealous. Nobody was jealous. Nobody wanted to be a tax geek. And I went from that to uh, working in gardens, learning, meeting people, collaborating with all these creative and knowledgeable people. It transformed the ground. You saw what it looked like before and what it became. And uh, it transformed the community. McCoy itself is now a place where families come. I see grandparents with their grandchildren. I see extended families walking the trails, having picnics. Uh, there are events there, uh, weddings, anniversaries, meetings, parties. Um, it's just been a wonderful experience for me, and I think for others. I was going to ask who all in the room worked on this, any of these projects, if you'll just raise your hand. Allison, come on. <laughs> Barbara, she, yep, and Sherry, and then there are others on, uh, on the Zoom meeting. And I'd just also say, if you have an interest in McCoy, I have um, I have the website name, and there's this is if you want to volunteer. I was provided that, and uh, I also have designs and plant uh, names that go with the designs for the pollinator garden. All three, all three initiatives, and they're here as well. If you have any interest, and I'm going to open up. Let's see, I'm gonna open up the, um, unmute everybody if I can. We still have 13 participants. Anybody that wants to talk can unmute. Anybody that would like to um, ask a question. Do, are there any questions here? Yes. The rocks, the rocks were sourced from a um, location down in Dunlap. I can get you the name of it. I don't recall. I had priced around and they delivered them. And then I think I got uh, Larry Roberts' brother helped unload them. He met us over there with his um, bobcat. Yes. What are you doing for managing weed control in the pathway? We we um we have the well we have that probably what's left of the the uh, cardboard and then we have wood chips and we also have regular work days we during the season we work first Friday and third Saturday and you know whatever has to be done people are gracious and generous to help do that and then yes curious where where are you heading where are your next project. Wow. <laughs> oh, I, I sort of almost got in over my head uh, the last couple of years. So I've scaled back a little bit, but I am working with uh, Joanne Albright on the Mount Opry Garden. I, I don't know. I, that, that's kind of as far as I've gotten. Oh, huh. oh and my, yes, I, I've kind of, uh, with all this going on, uh, not realizing just how much time it would take. My my own garden has suffered a little bit, not completely, but. 
Uh, any anybody on uh, the Zoom? Were any of the chat's questions? Oh, let me see. Let's see. Thank you. We have three. Oh, can you make your slides full screen? Well, that was back about uh, not about fifty minutes ago, so I apologize. Well, thank y'all. Uh, some kind comments at the end. Well, thank you again. Well, thank you what so a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the Zoom then. So glad to see all of you. Yeah. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Are the guidance plans available on the website? You know, they're not, but I'll, I'll work on making them available. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Rather than take your coffee. Yeah. So. I have been on the website. Thank you very much. Thank y'all so much. Enjoyed it. All right. Dave, I'll call you later. Yeah. <laughs>